Hi there, and welcome to this week's episode of the Matt and Sean 365 Refresh Show. This is episode eight for the week of January 25th, 2021. And uh, it's a new week. Sean, anything uh, new since we chatted uh, last week? Is it a new week? Is it really? Because as far as I'm concerned, it's March 16th, 2020, and has been for the last 262 days. Oh, I hope I made that number up correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never, I, I feel like we've been chipped out of uh, St. Patrick's Day. We're on uh, Groundhog Day before St. Patrick's Day since then. Oh, I know. I was robbed of every holiday. <laughs> I have uh, that share song playing every morning. That's my wake up song now, too, to, to really match with the movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like it. No, I'm, yeah. I'm good. You know, it's just it, one day at a time. Uh, it rained out here in the Bay Area, which for those of you who are familiar with the Bay Area is a thing that doesn't happen out here. We're normally just kind of 72 and sunny, uh, mm. you know, maybe a light breeze, you know, really tough stuff. Um, speaking of which, how's the weather in uh, upstate New York, Matt? It is freezing cold right now, but it's actually very nice out. It's nice and bright mm, like here 58. because the sun is out. No, like 10, I think, is the uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit about is what it is. That was right close. Now, so. <laughs> well, you have the thing um, when I was out in San Francisco last year, last February, before the whole world changed, I learned that the fog in the Bay Area has a name. Oh, it's Carl. Yeah. Carl with a K. Yes. And do you know the story behind that and like why that's a thing? So it's probably not the correct story, but my understanding is it was a Twitter account, like just a, a Twitter account of named course, the fog Carl. Yes. And, you know, took on the persona of, interacted with a bunch of kind of Bay Area brands. Weatherman like and other Giants. Yeah, right. Exactly. And uh, yeah. it just kind of took off. That's my understanding of it. Uh, Interesting. And so for all these people that say that Twitter isn't real life, you're wrong. Yeah. It was funny because just <laughs> I, we, uh, I stayed in a hotel in downtown San Francisco before I went to the conference that was down at the airport, which, you know, the airport's like 45 minutes away from the city because I, I wanted also to check out the city. not San Francisco. <laughs> right. Exactly. Burling game. Uh, I wanted to check out the city and like references to Carl were everywhere. And I'm like, who is Carl and what did he do? You know, like, <laughs> but nope, that was, that was what it was. So, all right, cool. All right. Well, I think it's probably time to kick off uh, with some updates on the Microsoft 365, 365 side of things and not just the weather of the, uh, you know, of Silicon Valley. So uh, why don't we just kick off with the news? This is the news. Released this week with an accompanying blog post, Microsoft is making available their internal release planner app for the Power Platform as a sample solution. The app, which includes a model-driven Power App, accompanying flows for Power Automate, and integration with Dataverse, serves as the hub for tracking internal features and development across the entire business app's team, which includes both Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform. The release itself isn't a feature per se, nor is it an officially supported offering. However, it's a great showcase of what's possible using the Power Platform to get real work done at scale across an organization. The blog post is a great read, and the app is available to download, deploy, and customize today. We'll include a link to the post in the show notes. After being announced at two different virtual conferences in 2020, the SharePoint app bar, Microsoft's new global navigation structure for SharePoint, has finally made it to the roadmap. According to Microsoft, the SharePoint app bar brings a consistent navigational experience to every site on your intelligent internet. It features quick access to important sites across the organization with global navigation, personally relevant sites, and the newsfeed. The app bar is scheduled to release in March this year, just in time for the kickoff of the second half of Microsoft Ignite. Another feature that's been teased, and by teased I mean announced several times, native SharePoint site templates also finally hit the roadmap with a projected March 2021 release. Microsoft emphasized the feature is one that will help organizations leverage existing SharePoint capabilities, things like pages, lists, libraries, branding, to quickly build or redesign sites faster and help site owners get inspired. As we've reported previously, it also appears that organizations will be able to create their own site templates as well. Death comes for us all, and so too do emojis. The Facebook liveification of Teams meetings will soon be in full effect as participants gain the option to react during a meeting using emojis that will appear to all participants. This feature is likely to be one that will be particularly useful in large meetings and live broadcasts, but only time will tell if the overall response is 
Another feature for the we couldn't do this yet pile. Next month, Microsoft Teams users on Mac OS will be able to share their computer's sound when sharing their screen. Common use cases include sharing the audio of YouTube videos and smooth jazz while going over this week's TPS reports. SharePoint admins, pay attention. Starting next month, SharePoint Spaces is rolling out as a default option in the new menu across all SharePoint sites. SharePoint Spaces is technically generally available, and currently, you can enable it on a site-by-site -site basis. With this change, all users with appropriate permissions to create content on a site will see the option. In the coming weeks, admins will need to determine whether they want to maintain current behavior, where currently site owners must enable SharePoint Spaces at the site level, or have spaces show in the new menu by default across your tenant. Finally, call it a just-in-time feature, Outlook on the web will soon support adding attachments and notes straight from the compose field of an email. By simply typing a forward slash while writing an email, users will get suggestions for files and notes to attach. This is similar to tagging functionality already available by typing the at symbol. The feature is slated to start rolling out next month in both targeted and standard release tenants, so keep a close eye out. That was the news. All right, excellent. Thanks, Sean. So in that list of items that you just went through, what's one of the ones that uh, kind of stuck out to you and you'd want to chat a little bit about? I want to start off with uh, just a quick touch on the internal release planner app that Microsoft put out for the Power Platform. Uh, yeah. I think that that's a super cool example of Microsoft taking what it is that they do as an organization and putting it out there as not necessarily a feature, but a showcase of what's possible with these when you invest mm -hmm. time in them. So this is uh, this is not related to that that planner uh, built-in feature that they have in the message center, right? This is something different. Yeah, this is completely different, and this is you know okay. one of the times where I won't, you know, the, the brass knuckles are coming off, and I'm not saying here we go with like and mind names uh, or like yeah, and yeah. kind names rather. Uh, no, this is something that uh, Microsoft's business apps team uh, developed about six or seven months ago to completely reimagine how their, their feature releases, their kind of their marquee feature releases or what they describe as waves, uh, get from Genesis to development, to documentation, to actual release. Uh, and mm -hmm. as opposed to what they were doing previously, which was kind of this ad hoc, as many organizations are, process of GitHub and Word documents and emails and Teams messages, uh, they centralized all of that into a power app that has automated notifications and accountability mechanisms and things to that effect. And it's a really cool example of Microsoft not just doing something for themselves, but looking at what they've done. And sharing it. Yeah, yeah and like sharing they, it. So this is essentially a power platform, a power app template, basically? Yeah, so it's a combination of a model-driven uh, power app. It also leverages yep. uh, Dataverse, uh, to my understanding. I haven't cracked it open myself cool. just yet, but it's got uh, it's got uh, Power Automate flows uh, invest ingested within it as well. So there's a lot of really great showcases in there. Does it require premium connectors and additional licenses to purchase? Given you know? that it incorporates Dataverse, to my understanding, the answer is probably going to be some level of premium licensing. Yeah. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> it's a fair so, question. Fair warning to everybody. Uh, and I think uh, the, the blog post on this we'll have down in the, uh, in the show notes. Yeah, so I'm going to put the blog post that Microsoft put out there. It's a really great, even if you're not necessarily uh, immersed within the Power Platform universe like I am, uh, it's a really great, showcase of how Microsoft thinks through a problem and the angle uh, through which they're coming at trying to support the community by, you know, rolling up something that they've done internally and handing it out to the to the masses, the unwashed masses that are you and I. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what about you? What's something that, um, uh, that caught your attention? Well, look at what finally made it to the to the uh, the roadmap after, <laughs> you know, was... not one, but two announcements. The I wasn't going to punch app. them while they were down. <laughs> I know, the, the SharePoint <laughs> home uh, in the app bar in Microsoft Teams. And uh, I think you said that that's going to be out in March. So just in time for them to announce it again at Microsoft <laughs> Ignite. <laughs> I do think that there has to be timing involved there because, I mean, Microsoft Ignite is right around then. So surely this was, yeah. we need it out by then. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. But this is just one of those things, though. We're, we've talked about this before, but it's like you announce it and then and it's it's a big deal. This isn't, you know, this isn't like 
meeting reactions in teams where like that's been on the roadmap for months <laughs> and like nobody really asked for that feature uh <laughs> but we were definitely transparent about that but the big ones like why are they missing from the roadmap and like who didn't put them on there was it a uh, an oversight because if it was it was a big one or did somebody specifically say no we can't share that which if that's the case that's like a that's an issue uh, and, and as a customer I feel like I'm not being told what I need to be told to plan ahead for having features roll out to to my users right like that's that's I don't know just I think that's not cool and I think the takeaway here really needs to be that these types of things need to make it to the roadmap because the whole point is the roadmap is supposed to be our sing our one-stop shop for knowing when what's coming and when and if something is missing from there i have no way to go after it right without pestering people and i shouldn't have to pester people and those people don't want to be pestered anyway you know well i mean scale that across the entire microsoft 365 customer base this is a fingernail uh a slice of a fingernails uh portion of the the base that knows who to bother, uh, who to, yeah. oh, right. or, or where to go. Uh, and if the roadmap is supposed to be that thing, that destination for the every person that is supposed to be working in the Microsoft 365 space to see what's coming and where are they investing time? Yeah. Uh, and when are these things coming out so that I can bother my IT yeah. team that isn't paying attention? So what's another one that, that popped up for you that you thought was cool? I really liked the, it's a small one, but it's a good one, I think. The, the, the slash command embedded within the Outlook Online Compose window so that you can pluck mm -hmm. a file. Is it? I'll, I'll explain the features. So you're, you're writing an email uh, and you need to attach a file. And you, you know, dear Matt, here's that file you keep bothering me about. I can just hit a slash command, uh, the forward slash, and it will trigger a search across uh, SharePoint, OneDrive, and uh, interestingly enough, and it makes sense, uh, Outlook Notes. So you can take all this information that is already out there and in line with writing that email, you can bring it into the email. This is no different than in Teams, the intelligent understanding of I'm typing Matt Wade's name and yep. adding uh, Matt Wade to the conversation. And I think that that's yep. also something that exists within the Compose window of Outlook as well with the names. So it's just... It's such a small feature, but it's a quality of life feature that will more than 10% of the user base use it? Probably not. But it's another example of thinking about how we can make the, those people, those power users or those quick typers or those people who are familiar with slash commands in Teams yeah. or in Slack, uh, <laughs> and, and just making their lives and their workflow just a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit more yeah. intuitive. Yeah, I've never been a big slash command guy. Uh, and I think that slash command, I mean, Slack was a, uh, a communication tool built by developers for developers. And then they realized we're making a game. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows that for people that don't know the history of Slack, um, the guy that created, uh, Stuart Butterfield created Flickr and then went off and started to develop a game. The game was a flop, but they developed this internal communication tool that they ended up realizing, oh, we could sell this. And that eventually became Slack. And they are used to having slashes and doing command bait, command line coding, which is something that people like me don't necessarily do. Sean, I think you're a little more technical than I am, so that might be something that you like more. Um, I, I will say that slash commands do nothing for me. Couldn't care less about them. Uh, and Teams really only incorporated them because Slack does it, so they have to. And I, even just <laughs> last week, I was going through the, the, the Teams user voice to see, like, uh, looking for something. And one of them was, neat, we, we absolutely need more slash commands. And, like, one of the more the top comments on it was, like, this is a critical feature. You can't even use the, the app without it. I've never commented on a user voice before, ever. I logged in with my Facebook account. I commented and I said, do not waste your time. This is not a critical feature. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> because it's such a small population that actually cares about it, which I'm sure I'm going to piss off people that are watching here because it would be that population that would use it. But like for the typical user, they have no idea that slash commands are there. It's a it's an education issue, which like, am I going to spend time on that or getting them to understand and use at mentions correctly if I only have their time and attention for three minutes? You know, like that kind of question. So but, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. It's in uh, the Slack community that I'm a part of, uh, that's, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of the internal incubator that they run to get a sense of kind of like market uh, customers and how they're oh. using it. Uh, Ooh, one thing special. that, <laughs> one thing that is really funny, just based on what you had said was, you know, Slack is constantly imbuing new, you know, slash commands into this. 
and the, the immediate progression when they're like, oh, here's this new thing that you can do is people will say, great, there's a slash command. Where's the keyboard shortcut? Uh, and right. then the, right. the almost immediate follow-up is where's the, the GUI? Where's the button? Uh, right. Because and I'm 100%, you need to give me the GUI. The GUI is the thing that, that matters. It, it's not about the keyboard shortcut. It's not about the slash command. Like, talk to the typical user. How many of them uh, know keyboard shortcuts outside of Control C, Control V? Let's, I mean, being honest here. Like, no, yeah, I don't. I have the right, ones like, that I do, like even as a power user, I have the keyboard shortcuts that activate certain apps on my computer, but yep. that's it. Yeah, and there's there's a few that make my life easier. I get the emoji keyboard on my Mac, I'm getting the search bar for, for uh, Mac OS search, you know, the, the, a few of those things, like, yep, those are big ones for me, but like me specifically, like I happen to launch my apps using search. I don't go to the, you know, the, deck, the dock or, you know, to the launch pad or whatever. That's how I open my app. So that's useful for me. But like, yeah, I know a few other ones, but I don't know. Like, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say don't do it, but like, it's just, it's just one of those features like the team's reactions, the meeting, <laughs> the meeting reactions where like, <laughs> boy, I hope that there wasn't some higher level, big picture feature that we've all been waiting for that you stole a bunch of engineers away to make this thing happen. Because I don't care if people are applauding me or hurting me while I'm giving a presentation to, you know, in Microsoft Teams. It's just, ugh. Uh, that's something that nobody asked for, but sorry, I'm derailing the conversation there, I guess. Tell me how you really feel. I know. I will always tell you how I really feel. What's, uh, what, what's something else that caught your attention? Oh, the last one. I just want to say the, uh, SharePoint spaces being added to the new button in SharePoint. I have so many thoughts. TikTok, TikTok. I'm still waiting and I really want to be proven that my assumptions are incorrect. I want to see a good use case for SharePoint Spaces, one that's not a kitschy, you know, one-off thing. I want to see it actually being used by real people for actual business work that's not just a different way to get to my files. Right. And I haven't seen that yet, and so much effort has been put into the SharePoint Spaces, and I feel like it was just for following along with the VR fad. I just rewatched Silicon Valley. Still hilarious. Oh yeah, it holds and up. like even they got on that whole big thing about how VR is just a fad. And I always thought to myself, VR is a fad. I'm like, yeah, you can get an Oculus, but like you're still standing in one spot. You can't like you know move kind of thing. And maybe it's not for gaming, but for work, you know. I guess you know in the situation where you're designing, uh, you know, parts for the International Space Station, maybe you know, that's fine. But like for the typical knowledge worker, that's just pushing paper as their job, you know, process, which no offense to them, I'm that kind of person too. But ultimately what I do just pushes content, right? Like, you know, out, it's not going to get me anything. So I don't really get it. I'm, I want, and this funny enough, I think I'm going to tell you but... <laughs> what we were talking about when we kicked off our conversation here, you know, this idea that Microsoft doesn't necessarily want to muddy the waters of our own perception by showing us how we should be using a feature. And I disagree. And I think that this is something where you need to inspire us because show me, I need, I need a really good lookbook for spaces. I do. I, I need something that's going to make me think what if, and I don't have that right yep. now because I being able to three dimensionally see my org chart isn't doing it for me. You know, I think about what my organization does, uh, you know, like we, uh, we're, we're an MPO or a metropolitan planning organization. So we do housing and transportation planning across the, the Bay Area. And it would be super cool to have 360 views at the top of every bridge that we manage uh, the tolls of, you know, like things like that. But that's not necessarily functionally pushing the ball forward, you know, but at right. least it's more than what we're seeing here where it's, you know, to come back to the Jurassic Park joke where it's just, oh, I can touch this folder. And I'll say as an admin, I'm disabling it tenant wide. I just don't have, Ooh. I am, you know, the ability Light to, words. you can you can enable it on a per site basis and we'll continue to, know you that. know, facilitate that. But yeah, like that, I'll be disabling it tenant wide because the reality is we don't have a use case for it. And not only don't we have yeah. a use case for it, but you know, God forbid that one of my, one of my units uh, goes and creates a spaces site and doesn't know what it is and is now confused and now SharePoint is confusing and now no I'm not going to use SharePoint. 
let's end that there. And uh, let's actually bring that into the uh, community uh, content of the week, Sean. So upcoming events, uh, we have only one change from last week. So on the 28th of January is going to be Collab Days Birmingham, uh, 29th, Power of the Cloud Power User Virtual Conference. And then new this week, uh, announced for February 13th, is going to be SharePoint Saturday Cairo, Egypt. Uh, February 27th, Scottish Summit and uh, Microsoft Ignite is still scheduled for March 2nd. And that brings us to the community member of the week. Well, actually, no longer is she a community member. She is uh, recently hired by Microsoft, so the timing worked out well here. But I wanted to give a shout out to Erica Telly. Congrats on her new position at Microsoft. She just took a role as a senior product marketing manager for information governance and records management. She is like a royal uh, member of the royalty of records management. Uh, she is up there with uh, Joanne Klein and uh, that kind of... Uh, group of folks on compliance and uh, uh, all that stuff that I just really don't know. And I always have to reach out to them when I have a question, but they, she is awesome in person. She does a lot of event planning and uh, just no BS, but also knows how to have a good time. Uh, and I've had a really, really great experience with her. She just knows so much. And uh, I think she's going to be, a, she's a really great get for Microsoft. I can definitely say that. Yeah. What an asset. I think, you know, I've known, for as long as I've been in the community, I've known Erica. Uh, she was one of the first people that I met uh, next to John Levesque. We jumped off the uh, the stratosphere in Las Vegas uh, together nice. uh, a couple years ago. Very that cool. was fun. Um, yeah. She, funny enough, is indirectly the reason you have an American Express card. Uh, because you yes. have one. Because I have one. Because of you. And I yes, have one. <laughs> because because of Erica her. had one. And she let me into yes. the uh, the Centurion Lounge in Seattle. And it was... Yep. No going back. Uh. <laughs> yeah. If you want to know anything about travel rewards and credit cards, she's better than the points guy. She's better than Nerd Wallet. She is just oh my. <laughs> she takes she's uh, she's one of those people that takes trips just to get the points, and and like it's amazing to me that people do that. But she does, and she keeps her status at whatever level. I, I can only imagine how uh, itchy she is right now, having you know all of us been. I can't imagine. Uh, you know, cooped up this year, but. But no, um, genuinely, such it. a wonderful person. Uh, awesome, Erica, yeah, definitely. if you're watching this, and I hope you are, uh, <laughs> I'm so excited for you. Uh, congratulations. Yes. Microsoft is better for it. And, yep, uh, best yeah, of absolutely. Luck. They, uh, they're they lucky to have you and uh, look forward to seeing you again at a, uh, an event in the future, which I know we uh, we definitely will because uh, she's, she's involved in so many of the SharePoint Saturdays too, behind the scenes, whether you know it or not, she does a lot of the planning work or like consults basically on it. So just an amazing person and just knows so much stuff about that, uh, that realm of SharePoint and, and, uh, and M365 that I just don't know. So uh, many thanks to her and uh, good luck and congrats on the new role, definitely. All right, so that brings us to the end. Uh, Sean, what's up for you this week? Anything good? No, I think this week, you know, like I said, it rained here in the Bay Area, so this is it's it's kind of that reset moment of you know just kind of getting everything in front of me and figuring out what what pressing things I need to focus on. You know, we've got new projects at work. Uh, I've, a lot of people don't know I'm in school. Uh, you know, trying to wrap up my bachelor's mm -hmm. degree, something that's been yeah. ten years in the making. So I'm back in that business <laughs> stats right now, which is. Ooh, God. Fine. Uh, it's I not calculus. You know, I'm so glad I'm out of calculus. <laughs> oh, I would take calc over <laughs> probability and statistics any day. No, it's just the, the differential between Ugh. logic and the actual mathematics piece of it. I'll take stats. Um, mm. Yeah, okay. so you it's... You can have it. It's all you. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, pretty regular stuff for me here. What about you? How's your side of the fence? Uh, so I have been working a lot on SharePoint uh, and building out uh, some websites, and I haven't actually touched modern SharePoint a whole lot uh, in a couple of years and actually like building content. And I've been actually really pleasantly surprised by all the feature sets in it. Um, also, some of the you know idiosyncrasies that are annoying to me, but um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to putting together the uh, um, some corporate homepages uh, internally soon for different organizations within our you know big network and. Um, you know, working with like the comms folks on these are the features that you have and already seeing just how happy they are compared to the SharePoint 2013 internal that they're Nine used day to. difference. Just, you know, yeah. And I, I, I always have to preface my meetings with people because immediately when I show them some of the stuff I work on, they'll go, oh my God, that's beautiful. And I go, hold up. <laughs> this, this, this conversation is not about how pretty it is. It's about the content and is the content good, right? Like, you know, 
a, a, a crappy looking website can have good content. And like Amazon.com, eBay, and Craigslist are popular websites for a reason because the content is good. But yes, it is pretty, but get over the pretty factor. You know, like it's, <laughs> but you know, for the folks that are gonna be managing this, the fact that the pretty factor is, is strong and that they like it, that's a, a great intro to get them into it. So um, another I'm shout out for the surprised. SharePoint design team. Yes, yeah. Yep, that lookbook too, showing off what, what things can do. Um, and actually trying to dissuade people from using the lookbook as a template source. They, a lot of them wanna import the actual template. And I'm like, nah, don't do that. Like, look at it piece by piece and like put it together in your head. Think about the content that you have and like try to fill those parts and put the parts together. Don't look at one of the templates or one of the design examples and think like, oh, I have to fill every space there with whatever I have. That's not the right way to do it. Um, so I've been, that part's been a little bit, um, uh, there's, there's always a little bit of pushback there where it's like, oh, I just want the templates. Like, nah, you really don't though. You wanna play with the, the web parts. Just play with the web parts, trust me. So um, yeah, so I'm excited. We're gonna be doing a little uh, hands-on, uh, getting our, our feet, uh, our hands dirty uh, with the comms team so that they can be actually seeing what this stuff is because um, they can be building this stuff themselves. So it's pretty cool. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this. Keep us posted. Yeah, definitely. So. All right, so that's it for this week. Um, as always, a like and subscribe is much appreciated. And um, if you have any sort of thoughts on this conversation, please leave your thoughts in the comments below, not up. They're down, they're below. And uh, I think that's about it. So Sean, thanks so much for joining me this week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. And um, we'll see you all next week as well. Um, I, I will say that Slash commands do nothing for me. Couldn't care less about them. Uh, and Teams really only incorporated them because Slack does it, so they have to. And I, even just <laughs> last week, I was going through the, the, the Teams user voice to see, like, uh, looking for something, and one of them was, we, we absolutely need more Slash commands. And, like, one of the more the top comments on it was, like, this is a critical feature. You can't even use the, the app without it. I've never commented on a user voice before, ever. I logged in with my Facebook account. I commented and I said, do not waste your time. This is not a critical feature. <laughs> like, <laughs>